Hello and welcome to our webinar entitled Developing and Administering a Custom Perception Survey. I'm Terry Mathis, the founder and CEO of Proact Safety, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. I hope this is a, a subject that uh, you've considered uh, carefully because I'm going to go into some depth about uh, exactly why you ought to do a custom survey on your own rather than just purchasing one from the outside. Uh, a lot of people have used perception surveys. They can be incredibly valuable tools, but I want to point out not only what they are used for, how they can be used effectively, but some of the limitations of uh, perception surveys. A lot of people consider them a full-fledged uh, assessment of a uh, safety culture, and they're really not. They are one aspect of a safety culture, and a very valuable, very interesting, and insightful one, but not the only one. And we'll talk about that and a number of other uh, ideas as we go through the materials that I have for you here today. Uh, one of the first questions that always comes to mind is why not just go out and buy a survey? Why reinvent the wheel? There are plenty of them out there on the market, and uh, a lot of people have done that. In fact, the vast majority of people who do surveys do exactly that. They shop around the existing surveys out there, find one that's the uh, best fit uh, for them, and uh, go with that. So why not just take that particular approach? Well, there are three things that I think uh, really beg for, uh, and actually more than three, but three main ones that I would like to suggest to you that you really ought to consider. Number one, uh, pre-made uh, perception surveys in general are outrageously expensive. I remember we did a project for a company back a number of years ago. We went to four continents and trained internal consultants in uh, a number of different uh, processes that the company wanted to um, to pursue. And I looked at what we charged them for that, and they had paid three times that much for a survey. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a consultant, and I was grateful for the work because it's the survey that made them realize that they needed these things that we uh, helped them help to provide to them. But I couldn't believe how much they had paid for this survey. When I looked into the survey also, there were several things in there that uh, uh, made me uh, really question the value of it. And we'll talk about those as we go. One of the reasons to customize a survey also is simply for terminology. Now, again, as surveys are going online and some things, uh, advancements are being made there, some of them do have some flex in the terminology. But we've found that it makes a significant difference whether uh, you call uh, someone a supervisor, a foreman, a lead, you know, whatever your terminology is like that, uh, it can lead to a tremendous amount of confusion with your workers if the terminology of your workplace doesn't exactly fit the terminology of your perception survey. Uh, and there's a lot of different terms that are used by a lot of different people, and some of them actually have diametrically different meanings. And uh, for, that, uh, for that reason, I think it makes a lot of sense to customize your own survey. Also, if you have any specific programs or initiatives or things that you're trying to do, safety slogans, uh, focused, uh, targeted safety improvements, anything like that. No off-the-shelf uh, survey is going to let you examine how those things are going. And when you customize your own survey, you can very much uh, target in on those things and find out what kind of progress that you're making as you go. And I think all of these are reasons not to buy uh, a, a pre-made survey. Uh, one of the things that the people who sell these pre-made surveys will say, and they will argue against uh, your creating your own survey, first of all, they want to mystify it a little bit because they are experts at this, and they want to convince you that you're not an expert, and because you don't have the expertise that uh, you really can't uh, do these the way they ought to be done. Um, there's a little bit of validity to that, but not 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 really as much as they will lead you to believe. Uh, one of the things, though, if you want a validated survey, uh, one of the reasons and overwhelming reasons to use one is if you want to benchmark exactly against other people in your industry. And it's not that uh, a validated survey is necessarily better than a non-validated survey. It's that you want to use the same survey everybody else in your industry is using, or you won't get an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. You won't really have true benchmarking because you'll be talking about uh, different things, asking different questions, and maybe not able to make an exact correlation of how your people perceive it versus how some other companies' uh, people perceive it. So benchmarking is going to be very inexact if you're not using the exact same survey to do that. But if you're just going to track progress, 
a customized survey is just as good as a validated survey for seeing how you're trending and how you're making progress over a period of time. But a lot of the, the, the pre-made surveys don't really have a value uh, to the responses. And because of that, it's, it's kind of hard to track surveys. You can see if people change their mind and what percentage of people change their mind or whatever. But uh, a validated survey uh, is, is basically uh, a, great, a great amount of expense and effort for very little benefit unless you're really benchmarking. So uh, how do you form the questions? If you're writing your own questions in a survey, how do you do that? How do you go about uh, populating the survey with something that you want? Well, one of the things to remember is when you ask a hypothetical question, you tend to get a hypothetical answer. Whereas if you ask a historical question or a flat out perception or feeling kind of question, which is something we'll go into too, uh, you tend to get a more you tend to get a more accurate response to what that is. Uh, hypothetical questions too are harder to to tabulate. It questions in general, it's harder to tabulate responses. Because when you ask someone a question, the answer isn't always a clear yes or no. It's not always a yes, uh, I agree with this, or no, I don't. So what if you make a statement and ask people if they agree or disagree with that statement? Statements have a potential of being more precise. So, so for instance, if you say something like, safety is has a high priority in this organization, uh, can you see how much more precise that your answers could be to that than if you say, what is the priority of safety in this organization? Uh, and again, if you give a little bit of a scale uh, to the answers that you can, so if you let people strongly agree or agree or disagree with this, uh, sometimes you get a lot more precise answers that way. And you can also measure the levels of agreement this way. Um, so one of the things that we recommend is don't ask questions in a in a perception survey, make statements and ask people to agree or disagree with those statements. You may have heard this term over there that uh, these are, sca these are uh, scored on a Likert scale. Well, Likert is the name of the man who came up with this, but basically what a Likert scale means is that the numbers are not really numerical. They really have no value. They are simply labels. So one might mean you agree, or one might mean you strongly agree, and two might mean you, you agree, and three might mean you're not sure, and four might mean you disagree, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, but the one, two, three, four have no numerical values. You can't add them all up and divide by or anything like that and come up with something. Uh, a Likert scales are harder to understand, and workers tend to, to say, well, wait a minute, I don't agree with that. Now, is that a three or a two, or, or what is that? And it, it tends to cause a bit of confusion or can potentially. Whereas if you label your answers, um, that's more straightforward. So even a, even a little label for the answer like A means agree and SA means strongly agree and D means disagree and SD means strongly disagree, that tends to be more straightforward to workers. And even the I don't know, a lot of times if you put a question mark uh, for that response like that and you make columns under that and let people score their response to each one of these statements, as they go down these columns, that tends to be a very straightforward and a way, good way to do it. You can also give weight to these and uh, make them have a numerical value. And I'll show you a couple of the ways that we do that. I like doing this because it does let you track this much more accurately. So for instance, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll show you a, a couple of the examples of that here next like that. But can you understand uh, what, what your survey is really telling you? A lot of these things are subject to a fabulous amount of interpretation. One of the limitations I mentioned earlier that we saw to one of the other surveys was uh, uh, this company came to us and said, well, we really need work with our supervisors because we only scored in the 45th percentile in their responses on this survey. When I asked the survey company what exactly that meant, they said, well, it means exactly what it says. They were in the 45th percentile. And I said, the 45th percentile of what? And the answer was basically everybody who's bought this survey. So you don't know if these people that are responding are in your same industry. You don't know if they have the same titles. You don't know uh, if they do the same kind of work, have the same kind of issues, anything. All you know is that they 
spent the same money on the same survey that you did and they answered it differently than you did. So for a number of those reasons, uh, I, I think it can make sense potentially to create your own survey. So what I talk, when we're talking about a weighted scale, this is kind of what we mean. What if you say, as I mentioned earlier, that SA means you strongly agree, A means you agree, question mark means don't know, don't care, doesn't apply, whatever like that, D means disagree, and SD means strongly disagree. So you make a statement like this one, safety is a high priority in this organization. If your desired response is that you would like for people to basically agree with this, you would like to create the perception or have the perception that safety is a high priority, then you can give the desired response a one. So you want people to agree. So A would be a one. Strongly agree would be a two. The question mark would be a, 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 a neuter. It'd be uh, zero in this. An undesired response would be a minus one, and a strongly undesired response would be a minus two. So what you would have is you can graph this on a scale that goes up to two and down to minus two, and you can see where your bar goes on the particular scale. When you do this survey again, you can put the next bar next to that bar and see if it's taller, shorter, uh, going in the right direction or whatever, and it makes it very trendable, makes it uh, easy to see if you're making progress, if you're really changing and developing the perceptions that you would like for people to have. Now, again, if tracking your progress is what you want to do, uh, having a customized survey has a lot of advantages for that because, first of all, you're tracking exactly what you want to track. You can make it where you can uh, uh, you where you can uh, trend your responses and see if you're making progress or not. And also because it's your survey and you own it and you've already developed it, you don't have to pay through the nose every time you readminister it. And a lot of organizations would really like to survey every year or twice a year, but it's so expensive they only do it every two years or every three years. And a lot of times by doing that, they really lose continuity and trending with their, with their values because it's just not frequent enough to measure. Also, if you own your own survey, you can use a part of it and do little sub-surveys from time to time, which I'll mention a little bit later in the presentation here also. And all of these have potential advantages that I think really uh, suggest that a customized survey can, uh, can make a difference. I mentioned this earlier, but just customizing terminology. You know, what do you call leaders? What do you call workers? What do you call, you know, what are some of the term, terms that you use uh, within your safety program? And you might think that these are, are quite generic and they're the same everywhere. They're really not. Uh, my organization has, has worked with over 1,600 sites over the years. And what we've found is that there's quite a, a significant difference in how people uh, uh, label various things. Uh, one of them, again, is, is leaders. Are, are these supervisors? Are they foremen? If you said managers, would people think of site managers? Would they think of middle managers? Would they think of corporate managers? You know, when you talk about workers, uh, what do you call them? Do you call them workers? Do you call them hourly workers? Do you call them associates? Uh, how do you di differentiate between full-time and part-time, between contractors and regular company employees? And other things like that. It, it's it's incredible. Uh, we did a project for Starbucks back years ago, and they don't call their workers workers. They don't call them associates. They don't call them hourly. They call them partners. If you work for Starbucks and you're a regular employee, you're given at least one share of stock, which makes you a partner in the company. And they want to create that sense of ownership within the company. So if you did a perception survey and said, what do you think the hourly workers do? The partners in Starbucks are going to be thinking of hourly workers as the contractors, very likely, unless you just really explain this. And even explaining it up front, you know, once people get into the survey, sometimes it causes confusion. Basic safety terminology also. You know, would you like to, do you have a, a cardinal rules, life-saving rules, uh, one-strike rules, I mean, anything like that? The, the terminology that you use for these are going to be radically uh, radically different and if if you use a different set of terminology uh, you know are people going to really understand what you're talking about these are just the basics here also if you have special programs if you have a behavior-based safety program if you're going through a VPP uh, star status uh, trying to accomplish that and you put these various teams together for that you know all that terminology can be built into 
a customized survey and it's not built into any generic surveys that are out there. So I think that I think this customizing of it is a really uh, strong uh, reason why you might want to consider making your own survey. Um, if you want specific perceptions, uh, these are something you can build right into your survey. The ones that are in most uh, off-the-shelf perception surveys are relatively generic, and some of them may uh, prompt you. You, you, you know, it's, it's a great thing to look at those and see what the issues are out there. But you know, we talk to a number of organizations that say, well, it didn't even really get at whether our workers think all accidents are preventable. Uh, you know, it didn't really get at whether workers feel responsible for looking out for each other. Um, it didn't really ask, are our leaders safety cops or are they safety coaches? You know, it asks, ask about effectiveness and how often they talk to you and things like that. So if these generic things that the survey companies think uh, are the indicators of safety are not really the indicators of safety in your organization, then a custom survey can get you uh, information that you wouldn't possibly get from an off-the-shelf survey. So think about this. What specific perceptions would you like to have? Uh, Sean Galloway and I wrote a book on safety culture a couple of years ago, and uh, one of the things that we talked about in that book was what is a safety culture and what would you like for it to be? So within your safety culture, if you're trying to form a safety culture and you're trying to measure an aspect of it with a perception survey, what ideally, how ideally would you like workers to perceive some of these various aspects of safety? Do you want workers to perceive that accidents are potentially preventable? Or is it okay that they believe that some accidents are just inevitable and there's no way to prevent them? You're not going to get that in a lot of the off-the-shelf surveys. So if these are important things to you, if you have items in your corporate uh, safety strategy or vision statement that lead to specific perceptions you'd like to create, specific beliefs you would like to have for workers to have out there, a custom survey can measure all of that, and a lot of the off-the-shelf surveys may miss it completely and not get you the information that you'd really like to have on those issues. Again, what values would you like for people to have out there in safety? How would you like for them to view the priority of safety versus productivity? Uh, do you want them to think that productivity is more important than safety? Safety is more important than productivity? Or would you like to drive the concept of safe productivity? Uh, putting these two concepts back together and keeping them from competing with each other. Um, I've seen a lot of surveys that ask about the priority of these two things versus each other. I haven't seen any surveys that ask, can you put them back together? Can you consider them equal? Uh, can you make safety the way you do work rather than something else you do besides work? Uh, just wrote an article on that that will come out uh, in June or July of this year. Uh, on this idea of putting safety and productivity back together in the mindsets and in the practices of people and safety cultures. So what's the importance of people versus numbers? A lot of, a lot of organizations drive safety with numbers. They set goals, numeric goals, for where they'd like their lagging indicators to be, and they try to get everybody to work toward those particular goals. Uh, that's a that's a pretty good way to get hands and feet moving in safety. Generally, though, you don't get hearts and minds involved in it until you stress the importance of people and not just numbers. I've told a story many times about a charity that uh, started back in the 1960s when there was a huge famine in Africa, and they started this charity called Save the Children. And they asked, they got on television and asked people to send donations because children were starving in Africa and nobody sent in donations. So they tried using movie stars to, to plead their case. They tried quoting statistics of how many uh, children were starving in Africa and how bad it was and everything else. Nothing sent money. Then they showed a picture of a beautiful but obviously malnourished little girl. And they said, this little girl is starving in Africa and the money came flowing in. What they learn from this and what we ought to learn in safety also is that people are not driven by numbers. They're driven by people. Uh, so if, if you make safety, if you put a human face on safety, it can have tremendous advantages 
But how do you measure that in a perception survey? Whether people value this over that. And most of the off-the-shelf surveys don't even attempt to do that. So if issues like this are important to you, um, they, the, you, can, you can build them into a custom survey. You generally can't get them in an off-the-shelf one. How important is teamwork to you? Uh, teamwork is, is, is addressed in almost all of the uh, generic surveys, but it's addressed generically. So do you have a sense of teamwork? Do you feel responsible for your fellow worker? You know, some generic questions like that that get on these surveys, but how would you like for it to be perceived? You know, do you have specific terminology that you're using in trying to build people together as a team? Have you asked them to do very specific things like give each other feedback or do behavioral observations or participate in various safety activities? Again, you can drill down right to the specifics of what you want in a custom survey. So what are some perceptions of current safety efforts that are uh, in a, that get into a lot of the surveys that are out there. And again, you can, uh, any of these that you want, you can build into your custom survey, but uh, a lot of these are built into the off the shelf surveys also. Uh, one is an evaluation of safety meetings. But how exactly do you want to state that? Do you want to ask if safety meetings really taught you anything new? Do you want to ask if you think safety meetings are a valuable use of your time? Um, you know, how would you like to word that? What would you like to know about your safety meetings? Um, you know, are they being held? If, if you have concerns that safety meetings just aren't happening out there, you can ask those kind of questions in a customized survey. They generally are not uh, in, the, in the others, or if they are in a, in a more generic way. So what would you like to know about your safety meetings? Almost everybody has them. They're required. OSHA requires that you document that the people went to them and things like that. But would you like to know about the quality of them? Would you like to know about how effective they are? The same thing with safety training. Um, how do you onboard a new employee? Do new employees feel like they got adequate training before they got put out into the workplace? Or are they paired up uh, with mentors once they get out in the workplace? And if so, how well, how well is that program working? You know, you can go into any of these kind of uh, issues that, that you choose uh, with a custom survey. Uh, supervision. Uh, do supervisors really drive safety? Or do supervisors drive production and wait for the safety professionals to come around and drive safety? If you want to know things like that, you can ask them very, very specifically in a custom survey. Leadership support. Do leaders really support safety? Do they talk safety? Do they personally exemplify good safety behaviors out there in the workplace? Do they, uh, do they walk the talk? Uh, again, these are all things that are, are interesting to know in your safety program, and you can nail down to the specific ones you want. Safety communications. Um, one, one caution with all of these, and that is remember that people don't know what they don't know. So if you ask a worker, was your safety training adequate to prepare you for the job? You may be asking them something that they really don't know. Because if they don't have any other safety training to compare it to or compare and contrast with, um, they're going to make a value judgment. Well, I got out there in the workplace and, you know, I could pretty well do whatever I needed to do. So I guess the safety training was pretty good. Or, you know, I know I got out in the workplace and there were several things I didn't even cover. So I don't think the safety training is very good. That information is that information is good to know. Uh, but again, do you need to drill down beyond the surface information and find out? you know, what this is really, what, what they really think about this. Um, also, uh, when, when you communicate if information about accidents that have happened, uh, either at your side or at other sites within your organization, do workers remember that? Do they uh, internalize that information? Do they learn lessons and keep themselves from repeating what uh, caused or could have prevented uh, those accidents and others out there. These are all things that uh, are potentially things that you would want to put into your own cut.
My my apologies. I think I got disconnected there for a few minutes, but I think we're back up and recording again here. Uh, we were talking about the uh, uh, perceptions that you might want to measure in your uh, in your perception survey as you're going through that. Um, one of the things that you want to be careful of, one of the things that can happen in a perception survey, and one of the things that the folks who validate their surveys are very careful to try to guard against is something called haloing. So, for instance, if you're if you're making statements and you basically want people to agree with every statement that you have down there, people are going to start seeing a trend as they answer these, and they're going to start saying agree, 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 strongly agree, 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 strongly agree, and they're going to, to uh, get in the, the habit of just going down those particular lines. So what does that mean? You probably ought to word some of your statements in the negative. You probably ought to word them in a way that your desired response is for people to disagree with those particular statements. Um, so uh, that way they're having to go back and forth across the columns as they go down there and they don't start seeing trends or patterns in that that they can just carry on down the page and feel comfortable that they've, uh, that they've answered it the way the company might want them to. One of the other things that's very important in a custom survey is to have what we call an anchor statement to ground the answers. One of the things that we put in a number of our surveys is basically asking people about, do you think this is a good place to work? Do you enjoy your job? Uh, you know, something in, on that order. Because one of the things you'll find is if people are totally discontent or disengaged with their job, all of their answers are probably going to be negative and they're probably not going to be objective. You're probably not going to get differentiation between what they think is working well and what they think is not. They're going to be just basically negative about everything that they're responding to. And because they're negative about all of these things, it's going to skew your answers and you're not going to get the kind of accurate information that you'd really like to have on this. One of the, the things I mentioned a little bit earlier is if you buy an off-the-shelf survey and it's an incredibly expensive thing, you're probably not going to do it as often as you ought to do it. And uh, uh, you also, if you buy an off-the-shelf survey, you're either going to have to use the whole thing or not use any of it at all. You're not going to be able to break down one part of it and do it more often. Or if you initiate a new program, you're not going to be able to just put out a survey asking people what they think about this new program and kind of tracking your progress toward and through all of that. You know, these little mini surveys uh, can be part of the survey or they can just be part of the workforce also. So you might want to know how the new 5S program is working in maintenance. So you could do just the 5S portion of your survey and do it just in the maintenance department. And you could do that uh, every month or two for several months and just see how the new program is picking up and if it's changing the way people think about it and if you think it's uh, really doing what you want it to do. Again, what if you have a, a rash of certain kind of accident or you have a, a bunch of new employees coming into the workplace? Uh, any specific issues like this can be addressed much more effectively in a um, um, custom survey than they can in one of these off-the-shelf things that you buy. Uh, now, again, some of the off-the-shelf surveys are getting where they are more customizable and where you can uh, insert uh, specific issues in those. Uh, to a large degree, if they're flexible enough, I would almost consider those uh, a customized survey. But, you know, and that, sol that solves some of the problems of terminology and customization. It generally doesn't serve the, solve the problem of expense. And these surveys, even though they're be becoming more flexible and easier to administer, are still generally quite expensive. So how often should you do uh, a survey and when should you ask people to fill out a survey? Well, a lot of it depends on how you're going to administer the survey too, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But think about what happens if you let people take time off work and go in and fill out the survey versus asking them to come in early or stay afterwards. You know, anything that's not important enough to interrupt work uh, tends to take a lesser uh, view of a lesser importance 
in the eyes of a lot of workers. So how do you want them to view this? Do you want them to think this is a really important thing that you're doing, or do you want them to think this is just uh, uh, bothersome busy work that we that uh, corporate makes us do or whatever, you know, so come in before shift, stay after or whatever, and let's fill one of these things out, get them done as fast as you can and get out of here. Uh, I think it sends a message exactly how you do that. One of the things to be careful of, too, is the impact of special events on the survey. Uh, if, you have, if you're about to have a layoff, if you're about to uh, uh, redo your uh, uh, incentive program or something like that, making the survey too close to an event like that or just after an event like that can have a significant impact on how workers think about this. Um, have, do a survey, uh, have a, a significant layoff the next day and do the survey again and see how different the results are and what you get. One of the other things about the survey is uh, uh, what you did with the last survey. Did you really communicate results back to people after after you got that? If, if your survey uh, results kind of went into a black hole and nobody ever heard about them again, be careful because that can actually create a barrier to getting people to openly participate in a survey in, in, the, in the future. Uh, so how close are you to other significant events? These can even be world events sometimes, uh, political events, uh, uh, economic events out there in the world can impact the way people will answer and respond to your survey. So how do you do this? Uh, the old uh, traditional way of doing a perception survey is basically pencil and paper. Uh, you can have people uh, mark their uh, check off boxes or darken in squares if you're gonna use some kind of scanning device to, uh, to do them. More and more though, the surveys are computer based and they don't, you don't necessarily have to set somebody down at a, a connected terminal. Uh, if your company has some other things where they have like tablets or or uh, iPads or other things like that. A lot of the surveys can be done that way and then uh, uploaded via Wi-Fi or some other uh, media. Uh, so a, a computer-based survey is, is quite a bit different. Think about this though, you know, how computer savvy, how computer or technophobic are, are your workers and is that going to impact how this is done? There are a lot of internet-based programs too where you are directly on the internet and your, your information is going directly to the survey company. I have a lot of people that say, well, Terry, you told us not to buy an off-the-shelf thing. How do we get on the, on the web? Well, there are a lot of web-based companies that will let you put your custom survey on their, uh, on their media and just use, just use their, uh, their program, basically, to uh, compile your own data. Uh, think about as you're doing this, though, however you do it, whether it's pencil and paper, computer-based, uh, directly over the Internet, think about confidentiality. You don't want uh, someone being asked to fill out a survey and having their boss look over their shoulder while they do that or asking to see their results after they're through doing that. Uh, so think about how you're going to maintain confidentiality. Some of the pencil and paper surveys, you actually seal them in an envelope, drop them in a mailbox, and send them off. Uh, that doesn't preclude, though, that sometimes they didn't get sealed in the envelope right away and someone saw them afterwards. So you need to be meticulous in how you handle these and uh, what you do with them as you go to make sure that uh, the workers feel confident that they can be open and honest in their responses to this survey without having negative consequences for doing so. So when you get the results of this survey, what are you going to do with them? Well, most organizations intend to respond to these by taking uh, some kind of steps to address the issues that are out there. But do you actually communicate the overall results or your synopsis of the overall results back to the workers who took the survey. And if you do, it tends to build interest. Workers uh, very often are curious. Uh, you know, I know how I answered these questions, but I wonder how everybody else answered them. And so when you show them the overall uh, scores uh, on these particular uh, issues, uh, they, get a, they get a better feel for how their fellow workers think about these issues. 
you know, if you're asking about a supervisor and you think your supervisor is fantastic, but you see low scores on that, you start realizing, well, maybe every supervisor in the organization is not really as good as mine. The organization sees that too. And when they see those scores going up, the workers are saying, ah, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to bring the other supervisors up to the level of mine. And uh, that's a good thing. It tends to motivate. Scorekeeping is listed by most of the experts as something that motivates workers. They like to see things getting better. And that's one of the reasons for having frequent uh, surveys is so you can track these results and say, are we really making a difference? And if you are, the workers see that score going up. They see the organization winning at safety. Uh, it can be incredibly motivating. If you don't communicate results back, it tends to have exactly the opposite impact. It tends to demotivate workers. They filled out a survey, but they're not important enough to get the results. Having information withheld from you is listed in every list of demotivators. Uh, you know, the, if you're not important enough to know, if this is on a need to know basis and you don't need to know, that can be incredibly demotivating. Well, you ask me for my opinion, but you don't want to tell me what the results were. And the real, the real trick with this is what I mentioned earlier. It tends to build barriers to having people openly participate and fill out future surveys. Well, if, the, if I filled out a, a survey or two before and nothing visible ever happened as a result of it, why bother with this one? You know, and who cares what, how I answer it if no one's going to be really looking at or using the answers anyway? So if you use the uh, scoring system that I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, what could that look like as you're trending it? Well, let's say that you do a survey every quarter and you're looking for ideal responses and uh, you see uh, you track them uh, quarter by quarter, year by year as you go and workers start seeing this upward trend. Now, I did it as a bar chart over here. You can do it as a horizontal line or anything else on this scale. But if you think about what I, I mentioned earlier, if you go from zero, if you go from minus two to plus two on the scale over here, you know, with, with this being your desired results, um, wh where do you go? Now, sometimes too, realize that if you, depending on how you do the scale, your your uh, bars can actually go below the, the baseline down here rather than up from it if you're getting negative answers in what you're looking for. But if you see positive results, if you see positive trends going forward, it tends to be a very good thing. Uh, organizations and safety, this is kind of a, a relatively new terminology for an old concept, but what people are doing is they're managing perceptions. They want workers to perceive safety in a certain way, and so they use these surveys to measure whether or not they do. If they do, that's positive. If they don't, that's uh, something that they need to take action to to uh, to work on. So what if workers uh, don't accurately perceive what their greatest risks are? What if workers don't accurately perceive the preventability points and sequences that lead to uh, accidents? What if workers don't perceive accurately um, what the most effective accident prevention strategies are that their company is following. Then they want to manage these perceptions. You see, perceptions are based on individual experience. And if you don't have a bigger set of experience to qualify that, then all your, all, everyone's perceptions are going to be a little bit different. And it's going to be difficult to align effort toward improved safety if everyone thinks of safety a little bit differently. So these surveys can help you to align um, these perceptions and get everybody thinking the same way. I talked to the CEO of a major uh, corporation a few months ago, and I said, what is your really, what is your goal for this year? And he said, to get all the arrows pointed in the same direction. When I probed a little bit more with him on that, basically what he said was, uh, for instance, in safety, I want everybody to have the same definition of safety. I want them to think of safety exactly the same way. I want to be able to walk out into my workplace and ask any worker, what is safety, and have them give me basically the same answer. They can use their own wording. They can vary a little bit like that, but I want them to give me the main concept 
of what safety is. I want to be able to walk out in the workplace and say, what, kind, what are the three kinds of accidents that happen the most often around here? I want to be able to walk out there and say, which precaution could prevent the most accidents here at this site? And does that apply to your work area? And are you regularly taking that particular precaution? And he said, by aligning these perceptions that way, by getting everyone to think of safety the same way, accidents the same way, uh, strategies, prioritize their strategies to prevent accidents, targeting specific safety improvements the same way. He said, that's the way I've produced excellent results in every company that I've ever run, uh, in safety, in quality, and in productivity. And uh, this was what he was after. So he wanted to, we were helping him develop his own custom survey, actually three surveys in each of those areas out there. And these were his goals. He said, this is what I want to, this is what I want to do. I want to manage perceptions. And his statement was, perceptions, if not managed, will vary by individual experience. He said, I don't want that to happen. I want everybody's perception to be based on the whole company's experience, not on their own individual one. So why would you want to do a custom perception survey? Um, you can make it your own. It's fabulously less expensive. You can administer it at will anytime you want to, all or part to everyone in your organization or targeted groups in your organization. You can customize what perceptions you want to measure. You can customize the terminology to uh, completely eliminate any kind of misunderstanding uh, about what you're specifically you're asking for, or who you're asking it about, or what program you're trying to pursue. And uh, you can modify this over time if, you, if you'd like to. And remember, anytime you modify it, you're going to lose your trends, or you're going to add new data to trend at some point out there in the future. But uh, this is so much more um, user-friendly. User it's so much more adaptable and adjustable. Every safety culture is unique, and to think that you can measure them with the same instrument is really a little bit naive. Now, again, if your goal is to benchmark and you're in a particular industry and everybody else in your industry uses the same survey, to, to really adequately benchmark, you're going to need to use that same survey. But that doesn't have to be the only survey you use. You can also have your own survey to track the other issues that are important to you, the ones that you don't necessarily have to benchmark with others, or you can use it to measure the elements that you think are going to impact those things that you're benchmarking with other organizations. And any way you use these, uh, they're relatively inexpensive, they are incredibly flexible, and they can be potentially very powerful. Most of the organizations that we deal with, I would say 60, 65% use customized surveys, the ones that really produce excellent results. Now, using one won't automatically guarantee that you'll have excellent results, and not using them one won't necessarily guarantee that you don't. But I think there's some tremendous advantages. I'm not encouraging you to do it or not to do it, but I'm certainly encouraging you to consider it. I hope you found this interesting, and I hope you do consider whether or not you would like to do something like this. If we can provide more information for you on this subject, uh, please feel free to contact us. This is one in an ongoing series of uh, safety webinars. There are basically two tracks that uh, we're going forward on. One is called Safety Excellence which this is a part of, and the other one is very specific to behavior-based safety. By the way, uh, uh, we have a customized survey that we use when we implement behavior-based safety at sites, and we have a number of sites that use or modify our survey and do it on an ongoing basis for those particular things also. Again, thank you for joining us today, and uh, thanks for your interest in this particular topic. would like to invite you to make use of the fabulous amount of information that, my, that Sean Galloway and I put out on the web. Um, you might can find better information, but you can't beat the price. It's all free. Uh, all of our uh, articles, all of our podcasts, all of our blogs, um, all of our videos are out there. 
uh, I apologize, we actually ran out of uh, bandwidth on our own website, and some of the videos are so large they don't fit there very well. So if you go to YouTube, you'll find that Proact Safety has its own uh, space on YouTube, and there's over 100 videos out there. They're listed by topic, and uh, please, uh, please help yourself to them if you can. I uh, wish we could give the books away for free, but the publishers own the books and they cost money to print. So uh, we do have to uh, we do have to sell those through the people who publish them for us. Uh, Amazon is actually the best price on all of them. Uh, if I buy them from the publisher myself, I pay it what Amazon pays for them, or sometimes even a little bit more. So if you're going to buy the books, uh, that's uh, that's that's the way to do it out there. If you if you would like to follow me or Sean Galloway or both of us. Our Proact Safety in general on the social media. Uh, we're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and what gets on one of the social medias gets on all of them for us. So you don't have to follow us on all three, but any one of them will get you the information that we're putting out on a regular basis. Um, I've always uh, said that there are two kinds of people in the world, the kind that care and the kind that don't care. And the kind that don't care don't get involved in safety because they don't care. The kind of people who do care can make a big difference in the world. And safety is one of those places that we need to make a difference. Accidents are preventable, and we can get better and better at preventing them if we all work together to do so. Thank you for your time, and thank you for all your efforts in safety, and best wishes for all that you're doing. Join us again on a future webinar.